from Geneva, WHO headquarters. Today is June 10th, 2020. My name is Tarek and uh, we welcome you to the regular press briefing on COVID-19. Uh, we welcome all of you watching us on different WHO social media platforms and all journalists who are watching us uh, on Zoom. Uh, we will remind uh, once again that uh, journalists who are on Zoom can uh, uh, have a simultaneous interpretation in six UN languages plus Portuguese plus Hindi. And this is thanks to our interpreters who are here with us and we would like to thank them for their work. Journalists can also ask questions in uh, those six UN languages plus Portuguese. Uh, and uh, we welcome to hear from journalists from all around the world when we start with the uh, questions and answers session right now. I'll give a floor to Dr. Tedros, who is accompanied again uh, by Dr. Maria van Kerkhoff and Dr. Mike Ryan. Dr. Tedros, please. Thank you. Thank you, Tariq. And thank you to all those who have joined online. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Although COVID-19 is giving us many reasons to grieve, Today, we're also celebrating a public health victory. Yesterday, the World Trade Organization, WTO, ruled that Australia's laws on plain packaging for tobacco products are justified and are not unfair restrictions on trade. Tobacco kills more than 8 million people every year. And Australia was the first country in the world to introduce plain packaging without branding in 2012. Several other countries have since introduced similar laws. The tobacco industry has done everything it can to have these laws overturned, including challenging them at the World Trade Organization. Effectively, Yesterday's WTO ruling means the tobacco industry has run out of options to challenge plain packaging internationally. WHO congratulates Australia for this victory, and we're proud that legal experts from WHO and the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control supported Australia in this case. We will continue to support other countries to introduce plain packaging as one of many proven tools to save lives from tobacco. I have spoken about humility a number of times over the last few months, and I think it's fair to say that this microscopic virus has humbled all of us. By definition, a new virus means that we're learning as we go. We have learned a lot, but there is still a lot we don't know. Every week we speak directly to countries, the media, and the public, so that we can keep everyone up to date on the latest scientific evidence and the evolution of the pandemic. In Monday's press briefing, last Monday, my colleague and friend, Dr. Maria van Kerkhoff, answered a question from a journalist about the extent to which COVID-19 is being spread by people we don't, who don't show symptoms. We have answered similar questions on this topic before. Yesterday, Maria and Mike also held a Facebook Live session to explain what we know and don't know about asymptomatic transmission and to answer questions from journalists and the public. Since early February, we have said that asymptomatic people can transmit COVID-19, but that we need more research to establish the extent of asymptomatic transmission. That research is ongoing, and we are seeing more and more research being done. But 
Here is what we do know, that finding, isolating, and testing people with symptoms and tracing and quarantining their contacts is the most critical way to stop transmission. And many countries have succeeded in suppressing transmission, in controlling the virus, doing exactly this. This is a new virus, and we are all learning all the time, communicating complex signs in real time about a new virus is not always easy. But we believe it's part of our duty to the world. And we can always do better. We welcome constructive debate. And that's how science advances. WHO's advice will continue to evolve as new information becomes available. We continue to work 24-7 to accelerate the science and learn more about how the disease is spread, what best practice contact tracing looks like, as well as the development of new treatments and vaccines. We will continue to talk to our member states, the media, and the general public about what we know and where there are gaps in evidence and how that's shaping our thinking. We will explain what we know, what we don't know, and what we're doing to find out more. We always aim to be clear about evolving science, and we're committed to accountability for everything we do and say. This morning, I met virtually with WHO's interns from many countries. I was not only struck by their creativity, energy, and positivity, but also how freely they discuss the lessons they have learned. Interns are a vital part of WHO's workforce. Just as they learn from us, we learn from them. As part of WHO's transformation, as you may know, we have been overhauling our intern program to increase the diversity of our interns and make it possible for more young people from more countries to take an internship at WHO, especially young people from low- and middle-income countries who couldn't get the chance to join WHO as interns because of financial problems. And I'm really glad to see that the number of people we're receiving from low- and middle-income countries has increased, and the diversity of people of our interns has actually improved significantly. We are also working hard to improve conditions for our interns. We now provide interns with health insurance. And this year, we started paying interns a stipend for the first time. And it's the stipend which is actually helping improve the diversity because we're getting people more from the disadvantaged countries. We're committed to investing in young health leaders who will build the healthier, safer, fairer world we all want for our children and grandchildren. I thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Tedros, for these opening remarks. We will open the floor uh, to questions now from journalists who are watching us on Zoom. Uh, one uh, last reminder that you can do that in six UN languages uh, plus uh, Portuguese. If you wish to do so, please be short also and concise and, uh, if possible, have only one question. We will start with the uh, Radio, Radio France Internationale and we have Jeremy with us. Jeremy. Hi, Tarek. Hi, everyone. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you so much for taking my question. I will do it in French then. Um, une question, uh... So I have a question for the panel, and uh, nobody in particular. 
but from the beginning of this press conference, we've been talking a lot about the different risks, uh, a risk of a lack of masks and PPE, of super spreading events, risk for African countries, uh, the potential of a declared pandemic with uh, weak health systems, the possibility of only having a vaccine in one country or not having full access to vaccines. So, what risks can be left to one side? What are the real risks? What are the risks that are most significant and which we will have to face up to in the coming weeks? Thank you. Um, thank you for the question. I, I think you've... Uh, possibly answered your own question with the, with the detail you provided, and I think all of the issues that you've mentioned um, are, are issues, and it depends, I think, on which part of the world uh, you're in. The issue of PPE for health workers has not gone away. That is still an issue in many countries. It's still an issue in many uh, countries affected by humanitarian crisis. Uh, not only the PPE, but the training for those workers. And we see health facilities uh, now in many, many countries coming under huge pressure and strain. Maybe not in Europe, maybe not in North America, but certainly in Central and South America, uh, certainly <clears throat> in other parts of the world. Um, so I think the, the risks that you outline are all risks. I think the combination of risks uh, and the priority of those risks is, is different, uh, as, 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 as you referred to in, in places uh, like Europe now, the, 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 the hospital system has uh, coped with the onslaught of cases and now the issues are about travel, the issues are around reopening schools, the issues are around risk management, they're around mass gatherings, they're around surveillance, they're around contact tracing. In Southeast Asia where countries have um, to a great extent uh, controlled the disease in, in places like uh, Korea or Japan, Australia and others, the, the considerations of government there are more around the re-emergence of clusters and how to safely remain open and then have sensitive surveillance in place to deal and jump upon clusters of the disease when they actually happen. Um, if you're in, uh, in Africa uh, now, and we've seen increases across many countries in Africa in the last, in the last week, uh, while the, the death rates uh, have been very low, there's always a concern that the health system can become overwhelmed. And how is the health system going to cope when you also have malaria, you also have other childhood and other diseases that require care? So I think each and every country has a different combination of uh, risks and opportunities at this point. And it's really down to national authorities to carefully consider where they are in the pandemic. This may be a pandemic, it may be affecting the world, but it's affecting each and every country in a different way, depending on when disease came, depending on how the initial responses were managed, and depending on how the disease is evolving at this point. Um, and uh, by no means is this over. If we look at the, the numbers over the last uh, number of weeks, this, this pandemic is still evolving. It is still growing in many parts of the world, and we have deep concerns. Uh, that uh, health systems in some countries are struggling um, and they're under huge strain uh, and uh, require our support and our help and our solidarity. If I may add, so just, just to add on to what Mike has said, um, there are the risks that are associated with COVID, of course, and, and Mike has outlined those, but there's also the risks for non-COVID related diseases that we must maintain our essential health services and make sure that we have vaccinations that are taking place among the people that need those vaccinations. Those programs need to continue and we need to find a way to do that. Another potential risk is, is the complacency. And, and as, as the DG has outlined, you know, we are seeing, it, seeing an acceleration in, in many areas and, and this isn't over. And even in, in countries that have had the, um, the success in suppressing transmission, there is that risk that a resurgence remains. Um, and then the last risk to highlight, I think, is that this dichotomy between thinking that we must have a public health, look, focusing on public health or livelihoods, like we must do both and find a way where we can find this state in which we can 
suppress transmission, we can save lives, but we can ensure that people's livelihoods aren't further impacted. So I, I think that's an excellent question uh, that you posed. It's the right one. Um, it's a complicated one um, that requires a complicated uh, response from everyone. Thank you. I think it, it, it has been said. Just one, one thing I would like to say on uh, the vaccines. As you know, WHO is um, working on helping to develop vaccines, therapeutics, and diagnostics. And as you also know, uh, there was an initiative that was launched by WHO and other partners on April 24. That was followed by um, a pledging event by European Commission, uh, President uh, von der Leyen, on May 4. And that effort is continuing. And the two objectives are, one, to accelerate development of a vaccine therapeutics and, and the rest. But at the same time, to ensure fair distribution and access to those who need it. And as you rightly said, there is a risk there of, for instance, lack of access to a product like vaccine that we will have in the future. And that's why we had the ACT Accelerator and also the CTAP which was suggested actually by the president, president of um, Costa Rica. And many leaders are now joining to echo the public to make vaccines or other products as global public good. Meaning there should be a political commitment by political leaders to have a consensus on making vaccines a global public good. If there is no political commitment and public political support to make it a global public good, then we will have the problem that you have already indicated. So I would like actually your question <laughs> uh, to use as opportunity to call on leaders to add their voices. So when a vaccine is discovered, that it should be a public, a global public good, and access to those who needs it be ensured. Because the most important thing in ensuring access is political commitment, and political commitment by our leaders. So that can address the risk that you said, the problem that you said may, may happen. And that's why we launched the Initiative Act Accelerator as early as possible, so we can break the barriers, one of which is the political challenge we may face and the political commitment that we need to counter, counter that and ensure access to a vaccine and therapeutics and other products that can help us to control this pandemic. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Uh, I hope uh, Jeremy this an answered your question. And now we will go to uh, Brazil. We have uh, Lara Pinheiro from Globo. Lara? Um, hello, thank you for taking my question. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, very well. Um, I would like to ask for the whole of South America in general. Um, is the arrival of winter um, supposed to help the spread of COVID-19, given that most of the respiratory viruses um, usually spread more in this time of the year in this region of the world? Thank you. Um, I think historically, what we, we do know is that uh, influenza viruses have a northern southern hemisphere cycle. And we do know we're entering the, the cycle of the southern hemisphere influenza season. Uh, what we don't know is how the coronavirus 
is going to behave in the in the same situation. Um, and certainly, there are different parts of the of the southern hemisphere. There is the temperate south. Uh, the countries like Australia, New Zealand, uh, uh, South Africa, uh, Chile, Argentina, which would experience a, an influenza season, much like a winter season in the north. And then there's that central equatorial region in which influenza behavior is not that predictable and tends to persist throughout the year. So there's that, uh, it, even looking at influenza, it doesn't behave in a particularly predictable way within the equatorial regions. Uh, right now, we have no data to suggest that the virus will behave uh, more aggressively or transmit more efficiently or, or not. The, the other question arises with the viruses uh, like coronavirus is a, in, the, in the European environment, many, many people would argue that uh, influenza virus is less transmittable in the summer because people move outside, there's less mixing, there are less closed environments with many people allowing the disease to spread. But you could also argue in other hot climates, especially with the advent of air conditioning and other systems, that people tend to move inside during hot weather uh, because the weather gets too hot. So there may be risks that are driven by both uh, by climate that aren't specifically related to the viruses themselves, but are more specifically related to the human behaviors that are driven by temperature or driven by the by the season. Uh, but at this point, just to be clear, we have we have no indication as yet as to how the disease will behave in future. But, uh, but in terms of South America uh, in general, uh, we're seeing an increase in cases across uh, Latin America, and particularly in, in, in South American countries. And each week I've spoken to this, we've seen a persistent and progressive increase in cases in Central and South America, and it is, uh, it is of, of deep concern. Um, and we need to focus on containing and stopping and suppressing that disease. Um, and if changes in the climate assist in that, so that, that's great news. But we, we cannot rely on an expectation that the season or the temperature uh, will be the answer to this. It is not the answer. Uh, we need to focus on the public health measures, the social measures, the hygiene, and all the things that Maria speaks about and <laughs> emphasizes again and again, uh, to continue to focus on those comprehensive uh, public health-led strategies that have proven in many parts of the world to be able to contain and suppress transmission of this disease. Maria? Yes, so I just wanted to highlight our influenza system that we have um, globally, that we're working with uh, so many member states, so many different labs across the globe, which, which we, I, I, I would, would uh, be remiss to highlight that we are building uh, the work that we're doing for COVID-19 upon. Um, as well as the work that we've done for MERS and the work that we've done for SARS. But the influenza network in particular has been in operation for decades. Uh, and the labs that are, are utilized across the globe are the foundation by which we are able to test for COVID-19. And so um, the system, the Sentinel system that is in place um, to look for influenza, to look for influenza-like illness or severe acute respiratory infection exists in, in many countries across the globe. And more than 90 countries right now are utilizing their influenza system to also test for COVID-19. Um, and so this is incredibly helpful for us to build on that platform so that we understand where the virus is within the community, aside from testing for suspect cases. Um, but it is critical, and the question that you highlight about the influenza season coming up in the southern hemisphere, it's important that we don't stop testing for flu. We must continue to test for flu as well as to test for COVID-19. And we know in a number of countries, the tests for flu have declined. So it's very important that, that countries remain um, and utilize their systems, not only for COVID-19, but also for, for, for influenza. And we are so grateful for so many labs across the globe, the surveillance systems that are in place, um, for the you know, hundreds of thousands, the millions of people that are actually working on this um, to help us understand where not only COVID is, but where influenza is, because we know that there will be an influenza season every year. We need this information for vaccine development, so it's really critical that these systems remain in functioning well in, in addition to COVID-19. Next question comes from Kenya. We have Financial Day uh, reporter, Steve Mbogo. Steve, can you hear us? Please unmute yourself. Yes, yes, I can hear you. Uh, am I audible? Uh, yes, perfect. 
Yes, um, in, 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 in several African countries, the numbers are going up. But the economic realities are forcing the countries to open their economies. Does WHO have additional um, measures that they could advise to the governments that they could take so that then we don't have a ca catastrophe in terms of exponential infections? Um, yes, I, I, I agree that there's been increases across a, a number of uh, countries in Africa over the last number of weeks and, and over the last week. Uh, thankfully, with that increase in cases, we haven't seen uh, large spikes or numbers of deaths. So what we're seeing is uh, um, uh, crude case fatality rates of 1% of or less, which is actually much less than we've seen on other continents. This may reflect the, the, the population, the age uh, of population in, in Africa, but also we have not seen yet uh, this disease reach very vulnerable communities and very vulnerable populations, so we, we don't know what to expect there. We fully understand that, uh, and the Director General has said this on many occasions, there has to be a balance between the, the lives and livelihoods and the public health uh, control of, um, of COVID-19. And there is much that can be done, uh, uh, short of the, the lockdowns that we're, we're speaking about, an investment, as we've seen in countries like South Africa and other countries, in good surveillance, in community-based surveillance, in supporting uh, diagnostics uh, for communities, in providing uh, adequate conditions for people to quarantine themselves in if there are contacts, in supporting that from a community level up, um, and in uh, being able to provide adequate care to people, medical oxygen, uh, and, and we've seen uh, in Congo and other places over the, the last number of days an increasing number of cases amongst health workers. We can protect our health workers with good training and uh, PPE. We can make the clinical environment safe. We can protect uh, specific communities living at risk in camps and other situations and try and shield them from the disease. Uh, we can improve community-based surveillance, syndromic surveillance, using things like the polio surveillance network, using the early warning and response networks that have been created across Africa in the last number of years, utilizing SARI and ILI surveillance that's been expanded uh, significantly in Africa over the, the last number of years, using the epidemiology networks like uh, AFNET, working closely with Africa CDC, the African Union, bringing governments together to respond to this. There is a tremendous amount that can still be done and is being done across Africa Africa uh, on, uh, on this issue. Uh, and uh, we fully, fully understand that, that governments are very reticent to go back into lockdowns which are uh, potentially damaging to, uh, to social and economic life. But at the same time, if that cannot be done and that is not appropriate and is, and, 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 and is not an avenue that governments want to take, there is so much more that can be done. And what we would like to see is the investments in those other things. It's, it's not a matter of should we do lockdowns or should we not. If lockdowns are not possible or not appropriate, then there are many, many, many other things that can be done. And what we would like to see is the investments in those other things, particularly in investing at community level in community-led surveillance, uh, in early warning, in quarantine, and in all of the other measures. And, and I think Africa has demonstrated massive capacities across the whole continent uh, to deal with other infectious diseases. But it needs support, and particularly countries with weak health systems need support. They need the support of the donors, they need the support of agencies outside to come and work in partnership with them. And I believe uh, our African regional office, the Africa CDC, the African Union, and others are really working hard together to try and provide that support to, um, to uh, those countries in Africa. So just shortly to add, to say that, um, you know, this is a, it's a very good question. Um, it is an opportunity for us also to, to learn how countries have lifted their, uh, the public health and social measures, these so-called lockdowns, how they've done it, um, and where there has been success, where there have been setbacks, um, you know, and how we can learn from each other within Africa um, and elsewhere, um, and to see 
what is it that, what approach did they take? We, we've outlined different steps in terms of what needs to be done um, to be able to be ready to, to lift those lockdowns. But the way in which it is implemented, the way in which these measures are adjusted is just as important. This slow and controlled way, making sure that it's data driven, it's not all of the country at once, maybe in certain geographic areas. Um, and it would be very important, it is very important to evaluate in detail how countries are coming out of um, the situation and, and those that are ready to do so. Um, we have a monitoring and evaluation framework, um, but we need this information from countries. We need more detailed information from you to teach us, to teach the rest of the world how to do this. Um, and I would like to, you know, just congratulate New Zealand, for example, you know, in the situation of having zero cases. I mean, that's that's quite an achievement. And I know they're not resting as well. They're they're ready, you know, to remain vigilant, to be ready to be able to de detect cases. Um, but these are examples of hope um, where countries are able to do this. But we do need to to support each other and learn from each other. Um, and that can only come from the continued sharing of information across countries. Many thanks. Um, from Kenya, we will go to Switzerland. Uh, we have Laurent from Swiss News. Laurent, if you are Yeah, can, can you hear me? Yes, very well. Yeah, thank you, Tarek. Thank you for taking my question. Um, there, there was a study uh, released by Harvard University and other US entities uh, based on satellite imagery that tends to show that there was an increase of uh, VI calls in front of Wuhan hospitals uh, as early as uh, last August, and they make the link with the, the possibility that the virus could have been present there as early as August and, and most likely September and, and October. Do you find that methodology, um, I mean, relevant, or is it a, a study that you condemn because of that link they make? Thank you. Hi, uh, thanks for the question. Uh, we work very closely with John and his team in in in, in Boston. I've I visited them uh, personally and discussed collaborations we have on epidemic intelligence from open sources. So uh, it's always uh, uh, what we what we I've said this before. All all of information we gather is important. It's important that we look at uh, all different approaches to uh, to uh, investigation of diseases and where they might come from. Um, but we have to also then look uh, carefully when we make associations or we make uh, assumptions then uh, as regards what a given uh, study finds. So it's an interesting use of uh, uh, geospatial information. It's interesting to use and more and more we're using satellite imagery to track climate change, to track population movement. We're using it to track everything from pollution to other things. So it's an important uh, new uh, instrument that we can use, and uh, and obviously now and in the future it will have uh, it will have great ap applications. But uh, it is it's, it's really important then that we don't speculate too much then regarding what the implication is of uh, cars in a car parking lot, and then make a jump two or three steps forward into what that represents, because uh, there's no evidence per se that, that uh, what, was, uh, what was supposed actually happened. But we'll be very happy to follow up with, with the team that have done this work and look at, uh, at uh, how they did their study and, and, and what the implications are. But uh, I think it's important that we, we read, we look, and as Maria said, where our teams here spend so much time reviewing all scientific information from around the world uh, and uh, doing uh, exhaustive analysis on every source. And we will look at every source of information and we will evaluate it and, uh, and, and validate that information and use, to the extent possible, all information in generating public health advice and generating guidance for our member states. Uh, but we would stop short at speculating based on these interesting findings, what that represents, because that doesn't assist us right now in following this disease forward and in doing the best possible work in support of our member states. Thank you, Dr. Ryan, for this. Uh, we've been getting questions on this from other reporters as well. Uh, we will go now to Helen Branswell from STAT. Helen? 
Hi, thank you for taking my question, and I apologize for what I'm about to do. I'm going to ask you an Ebola question because it's so hard to get information these days. Um, can you please give us an update on the uh, Ebola outbreak in Ecuador province? There's been very little information coming out of there, and I'm wondering, can you tell me if the WHO has received any funding for that outbreak response from the United States yet? Um, Helen, I don't have the, the actual uh, numbers here with me, but uh, in terms of uh, the response in the field from Mambandaka down to Bikoro, there are two potential points of disease transmission, and I think you probably know that we've began vaccination on both sites. Uh, uh, the, the imagery and the photographs uh, that we've received from the field show just how difficult it is to move and operate, particularly in the Bikoro area. It's an area that both the Director General and myself visited many times in, in, the, in the last outbreak. So there are major logistics uh, uh, obstacles uh, in terms of mounting the response. Uh, our colleagues uh, in UNICEF and other organizations are working very closely with us on engaging communities and building the community acceptance for both contact tracing and for investment investigation, um, and we will have updated numbers regarding the progress of vaccination, uh, the number of contacts and other, uh, others traced, and I'll be very happy to, to share that with you, Helen, and with, and with the group. I just don't have those numbers under my nose, and I don't want to give numbers that are wrong. With regard to, to fundraising, we're currently uh, using funds from our contingency funds for uh, epidemics, uh, to which many, many countries around the world have contributed over many years, and that has allowed us to mount a, a very rapid response uh, with partners uh, and in support of the, uh, the Ministry of, of Health and the Government of the Democratic Republic of Congo. And again, I might add that the diagnostics for this, the sequencing of this virus that demonstrates that this is a new emergence, probably from the forest, all of that capacity has come from the Democratic Republic of Congo and its scientific institutions and the Institut National de Recherche Biologique. The response is being led by government officials at both the national and the provincial level, and WHO and other partners are providing operational and technical support to that response. I think uh, Congo has demonstrated tremendous uh, advance in its capacity to manage complex epidemic events, uh, uh, both uh, scientifically, operationally, and logistically. But in the challenge we do face in Ecuador province is long distances, very, very scattered communities, uh, many deep uh, in rainforested areas, but connected to the major city of Ambandaka, which is right on the River Congo. So here we have this mixture of a, a, a situation that's potentially emerging from the deep forest, but is connected through urbanization to a major waterway which is connected uh, through Kinshasa to the rest of the world. And in many senses, that's a microcosm of disease emergence uh, and the challenges that we all face collectively. So uh, it's with great gratitude to the scientists, the health workers, the public health workers, the nurses and doctors of uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo, who once again stand on the front line to protect the world from another emergence of Ebola. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Mike. And thanks, thanks Helen. Uh, nice to hear your voice. I hope you're doing well. <laughs> um, just to add to what Mike said, um, the, just to answer the question about uh, U.S. support, uh, we had a very good discussion with uh, Secretary Azar last week, and he assured me of uh, U.S. Uh, uh, continued commitment uh, to support uh, in the fight, especially against Ebola, and we discussed as soon as the outbreak was actually uh, reported by uh, DRC, and we hope uh, to work together with the U.S. to uh, address uh, that um, uh, outbreak in uh, Western DRC. As you may remember, uh, it was in May 2018 that we had uh, the outbreak in the same place, Western DRC. And as Mike said, we have been to Bandaka, Bikoro, Itupo, and it took us three months, three to four months to control it from May to August. Uh, and that place is actually a very difficult place, especially um, the uh, 
uh, you know, the um, uh, logistical problems uh, from moving things from Bandaka uh, to Bikoro, a very difficult place, 150 kilometers, but it, as you know, it takes more than a day to uh, cross, and you, you can imagine how difficult it is to fight uh, Ebola in that um, uh, area. Uh, but we're trying uh, our best uh, to address it, and um, uh, we hope uh, that, like uh, the um, uh, 2018, uh, we would be able to arrest it uh, or cut it from its, its, its bud. Uh, but I would like to uh, say that it's um, going to be uh, a difficult, um, uh, a difficult uh, fight. Uh, but one thing that I am really confident about is the DRC um, has a, really a strong, uh, uh, you know, and um, uh, good experience in, in fighting Ebola. Uh, and they're doing their best, and that gives us, us hope, and we should continue to uh, support them uh, in order to finish this uh, as soon as uh, possible. Thank you very much, uh, and Helen, no need to apologize. Uh, questions on other health topics uh, uh, can be taken as well. We, as WHO, we respond to many health emergencies around the world, and uh, I'm sure we will be able to send you the exact uh, numbers immediately after this uh, press briefing. So thanks for that. Now we will go to South Africa. We have uh, Sophie from uh, SABC, South uh, African broadcaster. Sophie? Uh, I just want to ask about the vaccine. There is a perception in some African countries, but also generally on the developing nations, that uh, uh, they are being targeted as guinea pigs for trial and, uh, on, on vaccine. How are you going to ensure that uh, people understand the importance of vaccines if one is found and they are willing that uh, the medical practitioner can offer this to them. There's a perception that uh, only the poorer countries are being targeted for such trials and the usage thereof. Uh, we saw what happened with the statement from a particular doctor in Europe where he was indicating that uh, perhaps they should use Africa to do the, the test and the trials. So we uh, thank you so much. We, we, we have, I think, spoken about this, and I will give you our experience um, uh, to convince that my African compatriots, actually, they shouldn't worry about being, um, uh, you know, a testing ground. Um, we have started solidarity trial on therapeutics, as you know. And we have more than 37 countries now involved throughout the world uh, in the uh, trial. And some countries are from Europe, from Africa, from Asia, using the same uh, protocol, and from Latin America and, and elsewhere. And when it comes to vaccines, uh, WHO's position is the same using the same protocol in the whole world, the same protocol in all countries involved. And we don't tolerate any targeting of a continent or a country to do a trial or using it as a testing ground. We don't. So future trials, when clinical trials start uh, on vaccines, we will make sure that protocols are used and applied the same way in all uh, countries. Actually, the vaccines that are now in the front line uh, uh, will be uh, moving into clinical trials soon, and we will take this uh, seriously, and we will make sure that 
you know, the same protocol and same guideline is uh, applied. So thank you uh, for that, and uh, WHO will be at the forefront to safeguard that. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> and also, we're, uh, we're working on standardized uh, protocols for vaccine trials, uh, which will allow governments to be much more involved <clears throat> and engaged in regulating and managing trials that would occur and in strengthening regulatory and ethical authorities at national level to support that. <clears throat> and can I just, uh, maybe while I have the floor again, uh, just come back to, to Helen on the, on the, the data. Uh, uh, thing. Um, we still have uh, 12 probable cases, but two, two health workers amongst uh, that, Helen. Um, we have eight deaths, including four at the community level. So that uh, is a 67% fatality rate, which is not unusual at the beginning of an outbreak. But what is concerning, number one, two health workers being affected, and two deaths at the community level. And you and many of the other scientific journalists who track Ebola know just how dangerous uh, those circumstances can be and how explosive they can be. Uh, we have uh, uh, Ebola treatment centers set up, uh, and, and two currently there are four uh, alive confirmed cases in, in those uh, two in the ETC, but two, again, uh, people still at community level. And again, this negotiation for having people come for care. So if you think about the risk factors that drive disease, the fact that there have been deaths in the community, uh, the fact that there are cases at community level who don't wish to come forward uh, and be treated in an Ebola treatment centre, uh, and the fact that we already have had health workers have, uh, affected in the initial events around this disease, all uh, are, are worrying. Uh, there are uh, cases at, in, in six health areas and in three health zones, so while the numbers are low, those numbers are distributed across <clears throat> quite a large area. Um, and we're still obviously investigating the origin uh, of the outbreak. The sequencing, as we've said before, uh, is confirmed it's a new outbreak on Ecuador due to, due to Ebola virus strain Zaire, which is the same strain as the <clears throat> previous outbreak, but it's a different virus in the sense that it's a new emergence from nature. Uh, 289 contacts have been identified for follow-up. In the last 24 hours, we've managed to see and track and uh, uh, um, uh, temperature test 88% of those, and we've currently vaccinated 600 people uh, in response to the outbreak, both contacts and contacts of contacts, as well as 227 frontline health workers in a number of frontline uh, health centres and hospitals uh, across the region. We're also deploying Go Data, which is a, an integrated data management system for field data capture that allows contact tracing uh, and other um, processes. Uh, to move very quickly, it allows a uh, comparison of lab data with contact and case data in a much more efficient manner. Um, we're doing that in conjunction with the Ministry of Health uh, and also setting up a much broader EWARS or an early warning and response system across the whole province uh, to be able to pick up any alerts of any similar disease in the coming weeks. Thanks, Dr. Ryan, uh, for providing these figures for Helen. We had a couple of journalists who also asked immediately, can I get uh, these figures too? So here we go. Uh, we have a time for one, maximum two more questions. Uh, we will go now to, uh, to Moscow, where we have Associated Press Moscow correspondent Dasha Litvinina. Uh, Dasha, if you hear us, uh, please go ahead. Um, yes, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, perfect. Thank you so much for uh, giving me the floor. So my question is about Russia and its, uh, well, remarkably low coronavirus death toll. Um, as you probably know, Russia's official count of COVID-19 deaths does not include those who tested positive for COVID-19 but died from other causes. And Russian government insists that they're classifying deaths in strict accordance with the WHO guidelines. So my question is, um, does this approach follow the WHO guidelines on classifying and recording COVID deaths, in your opinion? And what's your take on uh, generally why there are so few deaths in Russia? Thank you. Um, yes. Uh I think uh, in terms of, of tracking the disease, and we've all tracked the, the emergence and spread and amplification of the disease in, in Russia, and it's been a very similar pattern to uh, many of the other developed nations of Europe. 
the the therefore the the low death rate uh, is is difficult to understand in the context of the uh, the population and the and the health systems uh, across the European region being quite similar in terms of their sophistication and availability. Um, the age profile of people in, in, in the Russian Federation is, no, is not greatly different to that uh, of other nations, neither is the profile of underlying conditions. So certainly um, between countries there can be differences depending on what is reported. So for example, uh, many countries report all deaths in COVID confirmed patients. In other words, they're reporting their deaths in real time and it's not related to certification of death by the doctor themselves in the official process. It's very often reporting there's been a death in a confirmed case. Um, and, and in some cases, that could overestimate deaths because uh, there may be other main causes uh, of disease. In the case of disease death certification, there is a standardized, standardized process that WHO has developed um, and has circulated to member states for the proper certification of death uh, in, in the case of uh, COVID-19. Um, and, and again, uh, like all death certification, it's, it is complicated and there are underlying and other conditions and what was the primary condition of the cause of death and what was contributing to the death. And that can be interpreted in different ways. Um, and uh, I'm not an expert on ICD classification nor on that certification, um, but it certainly is possible that it is the way in which doc physicians are codifying or classifying deaths. I don't think that's been done in any negative way and, I, it, and not in a systematic fashion, but uh, it certainly is uh, unusual that the number of deaths in relation to the number of confirmed cases is very low. But again, in the Russian Federation, they've been doing a lot of testing and they've ramped up their testing very, very fast. So you do see in situations where testing is ramped up and many more people are tested, that you do see a relatively low fatality rate. But it will be important that the Russian authorities uh, review the way in which uh, death certification is done to reassure themselves that they are accurately certifying deaths in the, in the appropriate way. Only one short comment, sorry, DG. Just one short comment about, not about Russia, but about deaths. Um, I mean, many countries uh, will go back and they will look at their medical records, med the death certificates, um, and there will be changes. I mean, I think it's safe to say, and we've seen this in a number of countries already, revisions of the numbers of deaths. Um, and this comes from a variety of reasons Mike has outlined already. Um, but it is important that um, you know, we recognize that this may happen and, and we may see large increases in deaths, maybe not. Um, but that comes from a review. You know, after many countries are out of the intensity of that transmission, that big peak of that outbreak, they'll go back and look at medical records of cases that were directly associated with COVID-19 infections or those associated with COVID infection. Um, and so we expect to see revisions in numbers of deaths in, in many countries. Many thanks. Uh Dr. Van Kierkorp and Dr. Rand. So we will take a last question for today and we will go to uh, Jim from uh, Westwood One. Jim, can you unmute yourself, please? Apologize for that. Thank you very much. I was wondering if I, if I remember correctly, at the very beginning of this, when the so-called lockdown measures, for lack of a better word, were implemented and other measures, social distancing and masks and everything. A lot of it had to do with hospital capacity, making sure that there was room in hospitals, that there was ventilators, proper PPE for uh, the healthcare workers. That's the reason for all the lockdowns. As long as hospital capacity is set, that there is capacity, is, it, is, is that the reason why it's okay to start to open things up more, or are there other reasons not to, mm. if I ask that question properly? Yeah, uh, thanks for the question. It's difficult to answer your question, because if, if, I, have a, if I have a million ICU beds, is, is it okay if I have a million critically ill people? So I don't think, the, I think it is one of the factors 
that it should be considered when considering uh, shutting down society in order not to overwhelm the system. And I think your point is valid in that regard. But there are many other considerations that need to be made. And I don't believe that was the primary reason that, uh, that governments shut down uh, everything. I think uh, it was certainly one that was driving it. And, and, and people have spoken about uh, flattening the curve. I don't particularly like that term myself. Uh, uh, I'd rather we... Uh, go for trying to be a, a bit more ambitious, uh, not just spreading disease out over time, but as we do that, trying to reduce the ultimate impact of the disease and actually not just flattening this thing down and experiencing it for uh, a terrible amount of time, but at a level at which we can bear, but we're a little bit more ambitious in our public health objectives in trying to truly suppress the disease and do like Maria said, countries like New Zealand have managed to achieve. Uh, and actually uh, get to zero. Not very easy, very, very complicated uh, in, in many, many countries because of so many contextual factors around population, poverty, connections with other countries. So this is a very difficult thing to achieve. Uh, but in terms of the factors, we're, I, 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 I believe that many countries, as the disease accelerated, uh, and as it became very difficult to understand the transmission dynamics, who was infected, who was not infected, the absence of systematic testing for suspect cases, I think many countries just could not see where the virus was. And we're seeing their hospitals fill up. And they look at these two factors. We know our system is coming under pressure. We know this disease is spreading. We can't see the virus. We don't have the testing. We don't have the contact tracing. We don't understand where this disease is, uh, but we need to protect our society. And it's not just about protecting the health system. Ultimately, it's about saving lives. And an overwhelmed health system saves less lives. How do we reduce the damage? How do we reduce the health uh, consequences of this? If we allow the system to become overwhelmed, the situation will even get worse. More people will die because they will not get any care or any intensive care. And I think many governments around the world were faced with very difficult choices. Uh, very difficult choices. Some of governments made that call early. Uh, some co governments made that call later. Uh, some governments shut down all of their society. Some chose not to shut down everything. Uh, some chose to continue with their public health surveillance and try to persevere with the public health measures. Some gave up on that because they felt it was uh, untenable and unmanageable in the context of the fire they were fighting. Uh, so I believe the decision in each country was unique to the context of the country. I don't believe there was a, a one-size-fits-all. I don't believe there was a single algorithm that anybody used. But I think while it's partially true that governments shut down because of fear of the health system becoming overwhelmed, I don't believe that was the only factor uh, that governments considered. Uh, and in situations where governments could see where the virus was, where they had a good handle on how the disease was transmitting and who was getting it, they were less likely to have to shut down the whole system. Uh, but uh, as, again, history will tell uh, who, who did that at the right time and in the right combination. But certainly uh, it would seem, at least on the face, that, that governments who acted early, governments who acted comprehensively, governments that acted with cohesive, comprehensive responses uh, tended to flatten that curve, protect their health system, uh, and are emerging now um, in, in good order from at least this wave of the pandemic. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I will just add briefly to what Mike said, and then I will move to another follow-up question uh, that I, we just received. Um, when countries resorted to lockdowns, social distancing, and, and so on, and as you said, masks, and so on, um, the hospital capacity could be one. But it varies, as Mike said, from country to country. And many countries actually were aiming to suppress and control uh, the epidemic itself. Uh, and they used the lockdown or social distancing to strengthen their testing, tracing, and quarantine, and suppressed and controlled the virus. And there are many reports, as you know, some countries are now not seeing even cases. So it can help in addressing 
the um, uh, overwhelming whatever situation we have seen in some countries in the health system. Uh, so uh, helped in addressing the number of cases that was flowing to overwhelm the hospitals. But at the same time, when you use it to strengthen your testing, tracing, quarantine, you can also suppress and control. So as Mike said, it can differ from country to country. And our advice has been actually for countries to use the lockdown and social distancing to hone and strengthen their public health capacity, the testing, tracing, quarantine, with the aim of suppressing and controlling uh, the virus. And still that holds true. And we encourage countries uh, to move uh, in that uh, direction. Then on the follow-up question from uh, Helen, I think uh, there was a specific part of it which I didn't address if we're receiving money for the uh, Ebola in Western DRC from the US. Um, w as I said earlier, we have discussed with Secretary Adar to cooperate in helping DRC, but uh, uh, I didn't say or we're not receiving funding directly from uh, the US. Uh, but I said it many times, I think in our relationship with the US, it's not about the money, you know, working together, the relationship. I think is uh, more uh, important and hope we will work side by side uh, to control or um, uh, contain uh, the outbreak in Western DRC as, uh, as soon as uh, possible. But the cooperation doesn't involve uh, the financing part directly to uh, WHO. Thank you. We will conclude this press briefing with this uh, last answer and clarification. We will have an audio file sent to you um, very shortly, and then transcript will be posted tomorrow. I wish everyone... Uh, I, I understand that Dr. Rahn has... No, a just a clarification, as I said, uh, 12 cases of uh, Ebola in Ecuador province in DRC. That's uh, nine laboratory confirmed and three probable cases. And what I mean, by, we're very confident uh, that those probable cases, given their epidemiologic links, would confirm cases. But some of these people obviously cannot be tested because they're no longer with us. So uh, 12 cases uh, the WHO uh, has of, uh, and the country have of Ebola, of which nine are laboratory confirmed and three are confirmed as probable cases based on their epidemiolo epidemiologic link to confirm cases. Thank you very much, Dr. Ryan, for, for this uh, clarification. So I wish you a very nice evening to everyone. Okay, uh, so thank you, uh, Tariq, and thank you to all who have uh, joined today, and uh, look forward to uh, seeing you again on uh, Friday. Thank you.